Okay. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone here this afternoon. I'm Jocelyn Gardner, Chair of Print London. And on behalf of our collective, I'd like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's panel discussion for the exhibition In Two Places, which is being held simultaneously in London, Ontario and St. George Barbados. Print London is hosting tonight's Zoom event from London, Ontario. So before we begin, in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we're situated is the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Lenapewak peoples, who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Wincy Delaware Nation. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. The beauty of coming to you on this virtual platform is that we can all participate on this panel from various parts of the world. We've become used to this idea over the past two years. But now that things are opening up again, it does seem to be a silver lining of the hopefully post-pandemic experience. The exhibition in two places is being held simultaneously at Satellite Project Space in London, Ontario, and at the Brighton Storeroom in St. George Barbados. Co-organized by Print London and the Brighton Storeroom, the project is a unique attempt to host the same exhibition in two places at the same time, while bringing artists and viewers together for a panel discussion in this virtual Zoom space. Um, the order of events tonight is as follows. I'll start by introducing you to Print London, to Satellite Project Space, and to the genesis of the project. Estelle Thompson of the Brighton Storeroom will then introduce their gallery project and the thematic aspects of our joint exhibition project. This will be followed by slide presentations by Patrick Mann and Alison Thompson, co-authors of the exhibition catalog, who will speak about the works in the exhibition. And lastly, two of the artists from each space, Bethany Pyle and Mark King from the Brighton Storeroom and Sandy Collins and Gosha Martignac from Print London will speak about their experience as participants in the exhibition. Print London was founded in 2014 in response to recognizing that there are limited printmaking facilities in London for artists who have specialized in this medium. In addition, as an educator, I was aware that many graduating students from Western University, Fanshawe College and Beale Heart Art in London, and those who are returning to London from having studied in various art programs across the country, were unable to access an equipped print studio without traveling outside of London. I founded the Artist Collective in order to build a professional print community that could bridge the gap between new grads and established artists and create opportunities for artists in the region to come together to explore and promote printmaking as an important part of contemporary art. The Collective is guided by a seven person steering committee and currently has 40 members from both London and the surrounding Southwestern Ontario region. Over the nearly eight years of our existence, we have programmed community-based projects involving youth and adults, run printmaking workshops, invited guest speakers, and focused on creating exhibition opportunities that bring printmakers in Southwestern Ontario together. Notably, we founded the juried exhibition titled the Ontario Miniature Print Exhibition, or TOM, in 2016, for professional Ontario-based artists. This exhibition now runs biannually and is accompanied by a catalogue. We have held three editions since 2016, with the number of entries increasing each year. And we will be hosting the fourth edition later this summer, which I'm pleased to say is now open to submissions from professional printmakers across Canada. Because we're a small group of volunteers, we've decided to focus on summer programming with changing projects every year 
in between the top exhibitions. These projects have included various types of programming, such as our series of presentations titled Mastering Lithography, with Canada's leading master printmakers in lithography, held virtually during the pandemic, to guest curated exhibitions such as Fire More Fire that was curated by Ron Banner in 2019. One of our largest projects to date, titled The Print Garden, was a series of print workshops and week-long residencies led by visiting artists, which culminated in a collaborative print cut paper installation at Satellite Project Space in the summer of 2018. The work that we do has largely been made possible through having the use of London's downtown gallery, Satellite Project Space, and the support of Museum London and Fanshawe College. We have also been generously supported by local granting agencies and raised funds through an annual fundraising campaign in the winter months. Satellite Project Space, the gallery in which the exhibition is taking place in London, sorry, I'll just change the slide. <laughs> Satellite Project Space is a partnership between Western University, Fanshawe College and Museum London which has started, was started slightly after Print London was established. This unique project has opened up opportunities for many artists in London. During the academic year, it is programmed with education-focused exhibitions and projects led by faculty and students from the university and college. In the summer months, Museum London has welcomed projects there that can benefit the community at large. Print London is grateful for the ongoing support of this project. It is currently overseen by a board and run by a part-time gallery coordinator, Shannon Taylor-Jones. The In Two Places project started in late 2020 following a successful Zoom opening event for TOMP 2020. Because of the pandemic, though we had mounted the exhibition at Satellite Project Space, we shifted to a virtual opening event and prize giving. Artists from all over Ontario were able to attend this event unlike in previous editions when only some of them would have made the trip to London to attend the opening. This planted a seed for future activities. Following Tom, once our committee met again to plan our 2021 summer program, the idea began to form of expanding further afield to reach other artists and audiences. The unique and beautifully appointed contemporary art gallery, the Brighton Storeroom, had recently opened in St. George Barbados. And my association with them as an invited diasporic artist from Barbados had already been established. Once the pandemic adjusted grant application system in London opened up again, and we saw that there was an opportunity to possibly get funding for a larger scale venture than we had previously done, we set the par partnership with the Brighton Storeroom in motion. Before opening the Brighton storeroom, one of its founders, Dennis DeCaries, had mentioned their potential interest in representing prints in the gallery. An exhibition of original prints by artists from both locations therefore seemed like a natural fit. I proposed the project of a simultaneous exhibition to Dennis and the gallery's co-founder, Estelle Thompson, and they embraced the idea wholeheartedly as being a project that would suit their vision for their evolving space. The pandemic restri restrictions could be overcome by what we thought then was the relatively inexpensive mailing of unframed prints that are made in multiples and the ability to host Zoom meetings and events in association with the exhibition. As with all ventures, this one grew considerably as we gained funding and developed the project. However, it has been one of friendly cooperation and mutual decision-making that has led to a very fruitful and worthwhile project on both sides. There have been a few hurdles that come from the lack of resources, but these have been largely overcome. My own relationship to this project has been incredibly special to me. I was born and grew up in Barbados, as Bajans say, my navel string is buried there. And post-university studies in Canada in the early 80s, I returned there and was actively involved in the arts community. I worked as an artist, taught part-time for nearly 15 years at the Barbados Community College, owned and ran the Art Foundry Contemporary Art Gallery in later years, 
and worked on the councils and boards of the Barbados Museum, Art Collection Foundation, and National Art Gallery Committee before moving to Canada with my Canadian husband in 2000. This is the first project that I've had the opportunity to work on that has brought these two spaces together in such a seamless way. The ties are strong between Barbados and Canada, as Sir Trevor Carmichael articulated in his remarks at the opening event in Barbados last Thursday. There's been a lot of cross-cultural fertilization between the Caribbean and Canada throughout the years. I'd now like to share a short video tour of the In Two Places exhibition installation at Satellite Project Space in London. The gallery opens directly onto Flex Street in downtown London that is steps away from Museum London and the downtown campus of Fanshawe College. The works in the show were framed in Canada and installed by myself and two members of our Print London Committee, Lauren Jen Laurie Jensen Brazier and Gosha Martiniak. So over to you, Cindy. We'd like to thank both Museum London and Satellite Project Space for sponsoring the use of the gallery over the three-week run of the show. So I'd now like to introduce Estelle Thompson of the Brighton Storeroom. Um, sorry, where's Estelle? <laughs> Thanks, Estelle. Uh, Estelle Thompson is a British abstract painter who currently lives and works between Barbados and what we call here in London, Ontario, the other London, the one in the UK, the real one. <laughs> Together with her partner, Dennis DeCaries, she has co-organized the Barbados half of the exhibition. Estelle is an established artist in Britain, teaching at the Slade and exhibiting and curating exhibitions internationally. 
Her work is held in major public collections, including the Arts Council of Great Britain, the British Council, the British Museum, and the New York Public Library. Her public commissions include Milton Keynes Theatre, John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, the South Bristol Community Hospital, and Quaglinos in London. Estelle will speak about the Brighton storeroom and give some insight on how we develop the project's theme and title. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, I had imagined that we were going to see the brief video, actually, of the Brighton storeroom space. Um, so we can do that right now, Estelle. Yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. I really needed that because I wanted us very much to get a sense of uh, the other space, the Brighton storeroom, so that you could see what a perfectly formed uh, but small and um, fine space in a beautiful setting uh, that is the Brighton storeroom. The Brighton storeroom was started in 2019, towards the end of 2019, and was established as a show space for artists in Barbados, the region and diaspora. And with a very program of um, exhibitions, both solo shows of artists that we repeatedly have worked with and also thematic shows that um, uh, uh, have come under various um, titles and topics that seemed relevant and of interest. Um, the Brighton Storeroom is uh, in the heart of, you could see there, the setting, it's uh, established and uh, within an, uh, a restored foaling uh, stable uh, within the Brighton Farmers Market uh, in the St. George Valley. And it is it has the most unique of um, gallery or artist space uh, opening hours in that we are open every Saturday morning in order to make sure that people attending that lively farmers market can engage in art um, literally in amongst the vegetables and craft stalls and other events happening uh, at that lively farmer's market. And I think for us, that is a very key aspect of the fact that the art really is there to engage the broadest audience that we possibly can. Uh, it's also by appointment, so it has other um, slots when people can come and see what we've been doing. And we've also tried to engage in a number of events that can really uh, enhance the general sort of cultural uh, activities that are happening within Barbados. Um, it's a very small group of people that are involved in it. And um, at the same time, um, I'll, I'll make some thanks at the end very briefly. Uh, this opportunity that came through conversations, as Jocelyn has said, um, with her and knowledge of her and her work and her involvement in Print London, meant that we had to, um, we were very excited about the possibility um, of uh, a print show. And yet we knew that the two um, bases that would be involved in terms of Print London and the Brighton Storeroom and Artists in Barbados, would be um, quite different in, um, in essence. Um, we very much wanted to look to something that would be a theme and uh, a brief to artists that really would be something that would excite them in relation to their own existing practice and yet would make a cohesive and coherent showing by bringing these artists together. And so we spent some time looking at and thinking about the possibilities of how we could uh, 
establish that kind of breadth and possibility to make it not daunting or removed from people's interests and own concerns within their work, but to find a theme that was meaningful and yet, um, as I say, very diverse and uh, could um, be interpreted in many ways. So after a period of time, um, as it says on the tin, we were very conscious that this was the possibility for two simultaneous exhibitions where the idea of a multiple um, came into its own and therefore work shown in two different places uh, at the same time um, would be the core of what would be happening. And so in a sense, conceptually, that was the core that drove the exhibition. There was the possibility in calling the show in two places and proposing that to artists, that it could be that that interpretation could resonate for them in many ways. For myself, I think Jocelyn's already mentioned about how the pandemic had perhaps um, somewhat halted the shift and movement of art works around the world. And there had been some sense of isolation. And yet, of course, through the way the world was dealing uh, globally with um, this pandemic meant that we were conscious and aware of friends and family, other artists in other places. And so that seemed to resonate. This was gonna be two physical spaces, not virtual spaces, not connecting in that way, though we are at this moment, of course, but that there would be two physical spaces and the viewing of the art in a physical space, artists from another place, um, alongside artists, fellow artists would coexist. And that was very, very exciting. There were conceptually, I think for me, I, I very much pushed for this title of In Two Places. And there were things that I felt were significant. I actually felt that um, um, quite literally in the production of a multiple, perhaps in many artists' practices, the ideas exist in two places, maybe a thought, a note, a sketch, a photograph. Um, but most specifically, when it comes to making prints, there will always be the production in the terms of making an image through a process. So it will exist on the plate before it exists on the paper or on the litho stone or cut into a, a piece of lino or a piece of wood or whatever. So the existence of an image in two places excited and interested um, me. Um, the evolution of that um, as part of the process of the thinking was you know, equally very, very exciting and interesting for me. And then of course, you know, very much there are histories to the Canadian um, Barbadian overlaps and links that um, I felt would often resonate for artists. So those are just some of the thoughts that um, I had, but obviously and unexpectedly, uh, or sorry, expectedly, artists interpreted that very differently. So I think very much in terms of the themes that existed with, within um, many of the artists' works, it related to family histories, specific situations, as well as processes. And there are many examples that I'm sure we'll, um, uh, you'll be aware of through seeing the exhibitions and that are talked about in the essays by Alison and Patrick that connect through to these different interpretations of um, the notion of uh, in two places. Um, I'm gonna leave it there. I just wanted to do, because I won't have an opportunity at any other moment to thank all of the people um, who've been involved. Obviously, Jocelyn so much. Uh, Jocelyn's already mentioned Dennis, who has been uh, working in Barbados on the show. Uh, also, you know, Alison and, and, and Patrick for their illuminating essays. But I suppose 
from, um, you know, many of the artists who I haven't met from Canada and those artists that I know well from Barbados, it's a huge thanks to them for uh, the works which have made such, um, you know, an enthralling and uh, exciting show. So that's it from me about uh, the title and, and the concept. Thank you so much, Estelle. Sorry, I was not realizing I <laughs> muted myself. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, as you can see from what Estelle said, um, this project has certainly developed in a very, um, you know, mutual way between the two um, organizations. And Estelle, yeah, is very passionate <laughs> about the subject. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so um, at the moment, I'd like to now turn to um, introducing you to the co-authors of our catalog. Um, you're looking at an image of the catalog. This was a very important element of the project. Um, it's a 50-page color catalog with essays by Professor Patrick Mann and Dr. Alison Thompson, um, who were invited by Print London and the Brighton Storeroom, respectively, um, although they then chose in their discussions to uh, switch the artists that they would be writing about, which is quite interesting. Um, the, their essays offer a comprehensive look at the particular works in the exhibition, and the catalog documents the exhibition and begins to open up avenues for further discussion, which the panel here this afternoon will attempt to encourage. Um, the, producing the catalog was a man of task, and we'd like to thank Roland Schubert for his uh, photography, and especially Liza Yorick for her wonderful design and careful attention to detail. The image on the cover is by London artist Eric Mummery. Its doubling and mirroring of a single image speaks to the language of printmaking in a very direct way. The catalogue was printed here in London and is available at both galleries. Uh, print London will also be mailing them to art institutions and printmaking studios across Canada. We're grateful for the London Arts Council and the City of London Community Arts Investment Programme, Cape Grant, uh, for sponsorship of this very handsome document. So, I'll, sorry, I'll just let me escape. <laughs> I'll now call on Patrick Mann, Distinguished University Professor from Western University, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, an eminent artist, writer, and curator, who has been an important supporter of Print London from its early days, and who has kindly contributed an essay to the exhibition catalog. Professor Mann is himself a printmaker and therefore brings his specialized knowledge to this task. Moreover, he has been a leading presence in London's art community and has contributed greatly to the development of art in this region, including chairing the Board of Museum London and playing an instrumental role in the establishment of satellite project space. His artwork has been exhibited widely in Canada and internationally. Recent exhibitions include Patrick Mann Messages Forum at the Thames Art Gallery in Chatham, Ontario, Written on the Earth at Macintosh Gallery in London, and a large-scale exhibition and research project, Garden, Ship and State at Museum London, which he co-curated with Jeff Thomas. Um, Patrick has written on the work of the Brighton Storeroom artists uh, and will now present his response to the work. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now just so I get my slideshow up beside me. Um, I think that's there. Great. So it's a real pleasure to join you this evening and, and it's a lot of fun to um, imagine people in even more than two places. So I'm gonna uh, make a few fairly sort of general remarks, and then I'm going to actually read a couple of paragraphs from my essay and follow up uh, with some specific comments about the six artists from Barbados that I was writing about, and, and that was indeed a great pleasure. I also am really pleased that Mark King and Bethany Pyle, who were in the exhibition, are here today, and so they will be making um, some comments a little bit later in the program. So as Johnson said, I'm a, you know somebody who has a long printmaking background, and, and I've taught printmaking for very many years. And so I do think about printmaking, what it does in the world, and, and what it makes possible. And so an exhibition like this, a project like this, was kind of dear to me insofar as it meant that some of the things that printmaking makes possible, it's 
it's nimble and can be exchanged relatively easily, if you will. Um, so that that's a kind of conceptual side of the medium that I, I think, you know, if we think about the world in which we live, we might want to even embrace that sense of, of nimbleness and, and uh, um, mobility. Uh, another thing that I was thinking about as I began to write the essay was about the importance of art as registering our shifting relationships to place and to communities and to time. And when I was speaking to each of the six artists from Barbados that I wrote about, I, I had a Zoom call with each of them, it, it was very clear to me that they were thinking about some of these kinds of concepts at this point in, in uh, the experience of the world in which we're living. Um, I'm also aware, and this is probably even more true in relation to, to the writing that I was doing, of the importance of artists and cultural people, what we would say, reaching across or reaching beyond. And, and uh, a former student of mine now, a colleague, Sohila Esfahani, when she was writing her um, MFA thesis, she wrote about cultural translation. And one of the ways of thinking about it is through this term, reaching across. And I want to uh, end these kind of opening remarks by saying that I had a wonderful experience speaking with each of the Barbados artists and they were very generous. Um, and certainly as an artist, I'm very interested in what the work looks like, but I'm equally interested in what's the artist thinking and to have that opportunity, I think we all know is a real privilege. So these are just a couple of paragraphs that begin my essay and, and get at some of what Estelle was talking about around this, this notion of two places. Artworks ask a lot of us as viewers and ideally offer us a great deal as well. They ask us to inhabit two places or sometimes to enter into numerous combinations of places at once. An incomplete list of these would include entering into the mind and heart of the artist while being aware of our own. Considering the space where the work was made and simultaneously the gallery or other setting in which it will be encountered or is encountered. And recalling the time period of the work's production regarding our moment of viewing it. The sort of before and now, you might say, of the artwork. So these two space combinations propose distances and gaps and blind spots that bespeak the longings and uncertainties that come with the experience of looking at art and indeed art's potential to knit the world together and to connect us meaningfully with others and other spaces. So my essay considered the work of the six artists that have a connection to Barbados, and that was a choice that, that Alison and I made to address the work of the artists that we might have a little less familiarity with. Um, they're contributing to the exhibition in two places and offer us a range of what I would call bifocal opportunities, chances to see the world from more than one vantage point or perspective at the same time. Through expressions in print media that hearken to painting, scale shifts that remind us of, vast, of vastness and detail all at once, narratives of place that productively complicate notions of belonging and other generative contrasts, I think all of their works remind us about how usefully complex the act of looking can be. I'm going to um, begin to talk about the, the works of the artists that I, I had the pleasure to write about. And this is actually not the order that um, I, I wrote about them for the publication. This is the work of Craig Yearwood. And I think Craig might be on here today, so welcome, Craig. I think of Craig's work as embodying a kind of what I might think of as a two space combination of thought, which actually refers to the island, Barbados specifically, I suppose, as a site, and also to the body. So in a sense, I think Craig is bringing together references to the body and bodily experience and thinking about the island and that place to very powerful effect. And this is one little paragraph that I wrote about Craig's work. I'm going to actually, the works, there, there are three of them in the exhibition and this one and this one, this is Balancing Act One uh, or Paradise Totem One. Um, these two works are um, very similar. Um, they, you might even see them as, as two parts of a, a continuous sequence. So Craig pre presents a silhouette of a man's head, perhaps it's drawn from his own profile, 
As the basis of a totemic structure that looms over a wavy sea, it's topped by a bullseye supporting a teetering paintbrush that balances a cawing blackbird and an evergreen palm tree. And you can all see that. An insistent sun gives way to a setting one near the bottom of the work, and an X marks a spot that's something of a no place within the piece, as if to suggest that paradise is ever elusive, not quite fixed in place. So when I was speaking with Craig, one of the things that, that came, came out quite, quite profoundly was um, the way that he thinks about the kind of narratives that he, he um, in, introduces into his work. And fundamentally, I think that, that he's dealing with, with, you might call it the problem, that despite the, uh, the beauty of Barbados, um, certainly the, the experience of COVID, I think, enhanced some of the this, this sort of challenges and contradictions that he experiences. But he's also aware that despite the beauty, there is also the presence of burdened local spaces, such as empty slave huts, and the memory of such historical experiences as segregation laws that make Barbados make his experience of it an island of precarity, as you might say, and I even think that might have been his term. So I think what Craig's work does is ask us as viewers to enter into what we might call multiple negotiations. And fundamentally, and I kind of ended my essay in this way, it kind of asks us, can truth and beauty coexist? Meaning, can we speak plainly and truth truthfully about our locations and also appreciate the depth and beauty that we may be surrounded by. So I'm going on to talk now about Dennis DeCary's wonderful uh, lino pieces and I'm showing I'm going to be showing you three of them. So Dennis as, as many of you will know is is a painter and so he has a strong relationship to intense color a real strong sense of design and an interest in figure ground relationships and you would see that in this work and this one and with his long-standing practice as a painter I think that uh, the Dennis has a great kind of identification and and you might say sympathy with the materiality of that that paint that that reaches the canvas and yet I think his choice of, of linoleum lino cut is one where he's actually sort of looking at the similarities and the similar kinds of possibilities that the lino cut print in oil-based ink offers that really does kind of echo his um, his engagement with painting so there's a kind of physicality about about the way that the ink works on the on the plate and on the image and and uh, Dennis said this which I think is really interesting because certainly his relationship to print and to painting comes out of his an historical way of thinking about about the crafts so he says the lino cut Picasso made in Valoris in the south of France in the 1950s strikes me as a key contribution to the evolution of printmaking. He says there's an apparent, apparent simplicity there that masks a profound complexity and it took me years of knowing still life with glass under lamp and he gives the French title which I won't, uh, I won't massacre um, from 1962 before recognizing that it celebrates the arrival of the electric light. And so I think in Dennis's work, light is a really key term. And this is, is I think, um, just a, a wonderful example of really a kind of reference to and a use of light in printmaking. And often, you know, when we think about the history of painting, and we could even think of Renaissance paintings where we're supposed to see the light kind of emanating from the face of the figures in the painting, um, I think we recognize light as a term in the history of painting. But in the work of Dennis here, I think he's really playing with and working with a, a kind of implied presence of light through the luminosity that's possible in building up the um, in building up the layers of ink. So I think that this work, Tall Vase from 2022, is a marvel for, for demonstrating the possibility of light within, within these printed works. I'm going on to talk about Versia Harris's wonderful small prints. And, and if you were watching the video, you would have seen that they are really quite tiny. And these are actually works that are printed 
uh, digitally printed and then hand colored. And the whole series is called Hundreds and Hundreds. And by that, Mercia is referring to the fact that the work is ongoing. There will be more. And I think what's really interesting and where you might say the two-place tension exists in her work is that there's a sense of, of tension or discrepancy maybe, or connection even, between play and what we might call trouble or even danger. And so in a sense, these works, which at first appear quite charming and, and very playful, the works actually bubble with tensions and contradictions that remind us that all is not as it seems. And Versia wrote this really wonderful little statement that I want to read to you. She says, fantasy is cultural, social, and political. The fantasies we have about our personal identities run in tandem with our shared ideas of our culture and societies. They're both shifting and reflecting each other. And when they inevitably contradict each other, the tension created is fertile ground for the new ideas we might have about their nature and creative space for, for new ideals to emerge. And I hope I didn't mess up that final sentence. So in a sense, I think Versia is really interested in the sort of knowing and not knowing quotient that is available through these narrative images she creates. And so even if we look at this center image where we see kind of a happy child skipping along, he, the child is, is uh, you know, balanced on a picket fence that nevertheless is made of sharply pointed arrow headed sticks. So there's a kind of a world of charm and also what feels like a world of warning. And so in essence, I think Versia's work actually asks us in a way that isn't dissimilar to what Craig is doing to actually negotiate questions and conjectures that actually, in this case, set us off balance in a way that I think is quite wonderful and, and actually offers us a lot of room as viewers to really engage with the works. So now I'm going on to talk about, if I can keep my notes straight, now I'm talking about Estelle Thompson's wonderful works. And you heard from Estelle earlier, and she talked a little bit about the works, or, or her, her interest in this notion of, of the two-place issue. And I was thinking a lot about Estelle's work in relation to what are the kinds of places that she's bringing together. And certainly in her work, we're seeing printmaking and her large-scale painted works brought together in a particular way and here there's a shift of scale so there are those kinds of two places but I'm also really interested with Estelle's work in the fact that we often might imagine that printmaking is a little less given to color as a tool than, uh, than painting is often is understood to be especially abstract painting. But I think in the hands of, of Adele, uh, I'm sorry, Estelle, and um, in the work that she's doing, we actually see color becoming not only a material, but, uh, but almost a term of the work, we might say. Now, Estelle's work involves flat fields of color, and you would have seen that this one is applied through a, a roller with what we call a degradé, a blend of color on it. This one is produced, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but it's produced with a silver ink. So what you're actually seeing is uh, a shadow of, of the, the person taking the photograph. So the, the image is, is completely reflective. And this one, which was made specifically for the exhibition, is, um, I think it's, I'm not sure, I can't quite see here, um, so I don't. Yeah, so it's a relief print, and I'm just not sure if it was a lino plate or a wood plate. But you can see that in a very specific way, um, Estelle is working with this kind of two-place, two-space problem in, in, in a way that's very direct in this case. And, and Estelle had these things to say about her work. With Outer, which was the first one I showed you, there's a distinct and significant gradation of color. She selected to include it in the show because it can something of color existing in two places, but also in a sense moving from white to blue. Further to this, the metal reflected ink, ink surface of mute, which I just showed you, reflects the viewer and the world as we look at it. So in a sense, there's that inside-outside of the print. And then finally, this one, two spaces at once. 
uh, as one, is the only print made specifically for the show, and it uses color from a palette devised from living with the very different light and color that she has had spent two years getting, or spent years getting to know in Barbados. So, immer and then it, during the pandemic, immersed in, in that light and color for, for two years specifically. So she was attempting to do what might be said to be the most possible with this combination of two small rectangles through very limited means of two colors. I think that Estelle's work has a great sense of presence and also the fact of the evidence of the use of the roller in making the works I think is part of, of what gives it that presentness. And interestingly, when Estelle makes her work, she makes it um, her paintings, she makes them with large rollers. So there is that, that combination of two places once again. And I'm on the home stretch here. I'm going to talk about um, Mark King's work, and then you'll hear from Mark briefly later on as well. So Mark um, is a Barbadian citizen who grew up in Bar Barbados as a child and then moved away and lived around the world with his family for a number of years and then returned in 2009 and found what he called a very um, engaging and sympathetic community and lived, lived in Barbados for about 10 years where his work, which is both socially and poetically engaged, I think really flourished in, in the midst of, of what is, I think, a, a very um, supportive community. What we have here is, is a remarkable work. It's called, If You See 10, There's 40. And you might think of that as referring to the, like the expression, the tip of the iceberg. You're only seeing a little, but you know there's a whole lot more. And so this work is a fascinating two-place work in the sense that Mark produced it by making of his studio what's called a uh, camera obscura where there was a small hole bored through the wall of the studio and he and the studio was completely dark and once he had set up the camera um, to uh, the basically to record um, he ran outside and stood in front of the hole and was basically or I shouldn't say he set up the camera, he actually put a, a piece of, of paper that would be exposed. So in a sense, what Mark is doing is really setting himself really in two spaces at once, which I think is a remarkable response to this idea. What's also image or also really important in the work is that Mark is clad in a dramatic printed garb, which he was the designer of the, the, the garb itself, along with Dutch fashion designer Breggy Cox. And um, so when he emerges from the, uh, the studio in order to run around and be seen in front of that pinhole, he's also really acting as a kind of performer. I think what's really interesting about the work is that it has a kind of operatic way of kind of looping back on itself. So we're not actually exactly sure where the artist is and where the work is. It's a tremendously interesting and compelling piece that really does address printmaking in a way that I think we could say is very avant-garde. So thank you, Mark, for your work. And then last but not least, I'm really pleased that Bethany Pyle is with us today. And this is her work. Bethany is a painter and her paintings normally are um, tend to focus on water and landscape, but often uh, more figurative and, and narrative images that often set boats and water at a distance. But in the case of working with this lino cut print, she's working very close up. And, you know, she's very interested in the beauty of, of Bar Barbados. And in this case, she said that she was concentrating on the rock pools on the east coast of the island as a place of wonder that reminded her of her childhood. And when I look at this work, I have a sense of water contained and moving and bumping up against rocks and really creating its own pattern. So I think that um, Bethany has found an opportunity to move out of painting and into print in a way that also shifts scale dramatically and to great effect. So I'm going to leave it at that. 
but also just simply say that it was a true privilege for me to write about the works of these artists. Um, I think I have one more Bethany's there actually. Write about the works of the artists and to encounter their thinking about their work in relation to plays. So I want to thank all of them and certainly it gave me a great deal to think about that uh, I, I really enjoyed. So I will leave it at that and thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, much appreciated in-depth look at the artists from Barbados. Um, next, we're going to have um, Alison. Alison, can you turn on your camera, please? <laughs> Great. <laughs> so Dr. Alison Thompson is a Canadian-born art historian and curator now living in Barbados. She has worked with cultural and ed educational organizations including the Barbados Community College, Barbados National Art Gallery, and the Black Diaspora Visual Arts Project, and is the founding president of ICA Southern Caribbean. She co-authored Art in Barbados, What Kind of Mirror Image, and co-edited Curating in the Caribbean. Allison is co-director of Punch Creative Arena in Barbados. We first met at Queen's University in Canada during our undergrad studies, and worked together closely for many years in Barbados. So it gives me great pleasure to have her involved in this project. Alison has written on the work of the Print London artist, and will now speak about that work. Great, thank you, Jocelyn. I'm just gonna share my screen. There we go. Okay, um, so I have to, thank Jocelyn and Dennis and Estelle for inviting me to be part of this project in two places. Uh, well, I've been living in Barbados for more than 35 years now. I was born in Toronto and I grew up between Waterloo and Ottawa. And so like Jocelyn and Estelle and Dennis, uh, the theme of in two places is one that really resonates with me in a very personal way. And I have to thank Patrick for suggesting in our early discussion that while he was based in Canada and I was based in Barbados, it might be interesting for him to write about the Barbados artists and I could write about the Canadian artists. Uh, because while I've been writing primarily about Caribbean and the Caribbean diaspora over the last three decades, there were a lot of personal resonances for me in the works of the 10 Canadian artists I was able to interview and spend time with. And in addition to bringing up memories of my first full-time job working with the documentary art collection at the National Archives or camping in Northern Canada, the overall takeaway from these discussions was the universal experience of migration or an experience of an elsewhereness, of a pull between different realities, whether it's geographical or cultural or psychological or time-based. And for me, this spoke ultimately to a basic empathetic impulse that is at the core of our ability as humans to communicate. It opens us up to dialogues of elsewhereness and otherness. The fact that the starting point for this conversation was printmaking is quite brilliant. The very essence of print media is the capacity to exist as multiples and therefore to be disseminated to and be in more than one place. And so that is what enabled this exhibition to literally exist in two places at once. In addition to this, printmaking is implicitly linked to the colonizing process throughout the Americas. Its technological advances coincided with European exploration into the colonization of the Americas and facilitated the circulation of stories and images of a new world, both in Canada and throughout the Caribbean. Itinerant artists produced records of these new strange lands for a curious European audience. It seems fitting then that printmaking serves as the premise to bring together Canada and Barbados to explore this theme of distance and separation and complexity and what prints are uniquely po poised to tackle, multiplicity, layering, sameness and difference. For several of the artists, the concept of place conjured notions of home, particularly in response to the global pandemic when enforced isolation fundamentally impacted our interaction with the outside world. Relationships, family, ancestry, caregiving, and self-care intensified in significance during this time. 
for artist Jen Hamilton, whose work has focused on the postpartum feelings of isolation and the challenges of trying to balance the demands of young motherhood, the pandemic brought a certain degree of validation to her experiences with the new reality that everyone seemingly shared the anxieties of home isolation and intensified demands of caregiving. Jen attached printing plates to her two boys, encouraging them to run around to capture the scrapes and scuffs of their playful activities and incorporated these recorded marks into the simple silhouette of a house. Inspired by the regrowth of perennial flowers in her garden, she adds brilliant color and gestural marks of oil pastel. She's also incorporated stitching and in one of the images traces of lace as an acknowledgement of women's labor their role as menders and nurturers, as well as her own family's generational involvement in the textile industry. The layering of traditional and experimental techniques and media afforded by her approach to printmaking reflects the improvis improvis <laughs> improvisational, often chaotic and messy job of mothering, but also the surprising revelations that can emerge. Elisa Beth Engels also explores family relationships and the dichotomy of what is visible and what is hidden. Engels looks at Canadian Jewish identity and the rise of anti-Semitism, but also youthful joy and vulnerability, as well as her own physical health challenges. In Repose, which you see on the screen here, the artist's son lies silently at the bottom of the composition, while a network of tendrils tie him to an ominous cloud above. It's pattern derived from drawings of the artist's MRI brain scans. Hidden within the calligraphic chords is the Hebrew word shalom, a silent prayer for peace and protection. The prominence of blue, the color of the second chakra, emphasizes the importance of communication, of listening, as well as speaking. Cindy Talbot was inspired by her children's Métis heritage to look at her own aesthetic choices in her Victorian home, which had become a sort of museum of Victorian antiquities, an expression of a very particular experience. Through extensive research into Indigenous history, Cindy located a number of portrait photographs of acknowledged Indigenous leaders and heroes. She overlays these images with dry point etchings of the objects that she's collected, particularly religious objects, a bust of a suffering Christ figure or an ornate crucifix. And these are stitched together at the top. So there is this layered experience of seeing two images at once, one a ghostly image that haunts and seeps through the other, creating rich and complex narratives of the relationships between them. In a series of prints entitled Elsewhere, which you're looking at here, Gosha Martignac uses the technique of vitriography to create ghostly posthumous portraits that explore her interest in death, not as something to be feared, but as a source of beauty and possibility for regeneration. While accepting that there are a multiplicity of beliefs regarding what happens after we die, Gosha takes comfort in the idea that life continues as nature takes over. She discovered an archive of what are known as post-mortem portraits, posed photographs of deceased loved ones, which were popular in the Victorian period. She's made a digital study of the archival photo, which is then converted onto a glass plate. She superimposes symbols of beauty and death as was popular at the time, such as bunches of flowers, further obscuring the legibility of the subject. For her, the other place, the afterlife, is not a sad or terrifying prospect, but rather is inevitable and regenerative. Sandy Collins uses lino cuts to build up layers of intense and rich color. In this image entitled Have a Seat, Collins returns to an earlier image of a chair, an object with deep personal associations to family history, belong, a belonging passed down from one generation to another and as such, a symbol of past relationships. Despite the humorous title, Have a Seat, the focus is not on any sitter, but rather on the structure of the furniture, which seems to glow with an intensity of golden light, radiating power that belies its humble form. The freedom with which she composes images and builds up layer and color and pattern results in a very vibrant and energized print. 
the artist embraces the surprise element of such an approach and the revelations presented as the paper is pulled from the linoleum. Phyllis Gordon is inspired by the nature that surrounds her rural Ontario, surrounds her in rural Ontario. She creates intricate woodcut prints of lichen that encourage the viewer to bring a focused attention to the intricacy of detail and beauty in their pattern and subtle coloring. Lichens are a fascinating life form, I discovered through my conversations with Phyllis, that tell a story of interkingdom collaboration where separate things come together and converge, an apt metaphor with which to re-examine our relationship with the world and to better understand the boundaries of where one life form ends and another begins. A composite organism of algae and fungi living in a mutualistic relationship, light can occur in many different environments and can grow on almost any surface, surviving in some of the most extreme conditions. Gordon is fascinated by the capacity of lichen to survive. They are the basic building blocks of nature and bridge non-life and life forms together. Their intricate mandala-like form provides an interesting transition to the work of Eric Mummery, who is also interested in intricate, complex and meandering patterns. But his entangled imagery emerges from an interior world. Mummery is intrigued by the capacity of artistic expression to promote self-reflection and emotional healing as a way of dealing with depression and anxiety. He creates graphic studies made up of what he describes as interconnecting fragments of disparate geometric, organic, and figurative elements that evolve in a focus, but also intuitive process. Inspired by the form of the mandala, he develops compositions of repeating patterns that rotate around a central point. Using the technique of woodblock engraving, the square image is printed on very thin Japanese Mitsumata paper, which allows the print to be seen clearly in reverse on the opposite side. The single image is repeated four times and assembled into a single composition, two of these squares inverted to create the mirrored pattern. The woodcut resembles illuminated manuscripts with intricately looping lines, repeated and reflected patterns, as well as the emerging apparition of fantastical creatures. This attempt to express or externalize his internal life in order to interact more productively with the wider world serves as the analogy of the theme of the exhibition, that is to simultaneously exist in and engage with two places. For Carol Cooper, the theme in two places also speaks to her own very immediate personal and emotional experiences, conjuring memories of a separation necessitated by a long distance love affair. Cooper was inspired by the work of the Australian op artist, Jakob Agam, who was inspired by the ancient technique of tabula scalata, using the accordion fold technique, which combines two images, one of which is visible if you look at the work from the left and another if approached from the right. But Cooper focuses on this vivid color and radiating pattern that creates a very energized optical experience. This idea of integrating and unifying the two distinct images in one work seemed to Cooper to reflect her desires at that time and also to link to this theme of the exhibition. Here's a work by Lane Grunewig, which was created by a series of intaglio prints celebrating the vinyl record by utilizing the record as his subject or imagery, as well as the literal printing plate from which to make the image, Lane develops the series as a metaphor for the medium of printing itself. Like prints, vinyl records are pressed or stamped from a matrix and produced in multiples, existing simultaneously in more than one place at the same time. The artist carefully inks the vinyl disc to create sensitive impressions that capture not only the concentric grooves, but also the nicks and scratches, the signs of imperfections that attest to the record's history of production and use. The vinyl record is a nostalgic object for the artist, connected to his love of music growing up and long hours spent in record stores, avidly collecting records and DJing. These prints make sound visible while also celebrating the physicality of, of the object itself. The titles of the individual works 
reference the language of the analog music process or point to punning analogies. Here, 1245 is a homage to the terminology used to describe the different record formats. A 12 inch disc is superimposed by the smaller 45 RPM single. Jocelyn Gardner's Song of Innocence and Experience is a series of prints inspired by a small black and white ambrotype, circa 1858, which depicts Harriet Thomas Weeks, a black nanny dressed in traditional Creole attire, holding a white infant. The photograph has been carefully preserved in a portable diptych frame, which closes like a book. Currently in the collection of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the object was recently on display at Toronto's Art Gallery of Ontario in the exhibition, um, Fragments of Epic Memory, where Gardner first saw it. Like Gardner, this object had migrated, if only temporarily, from Barbados to Ontario. Describing the significance of this discovery, she writes, seeing this artifact from Barbados on display in Canada sparked my interest on many levels as treasured personal heirloom from my homeland that possibly held cherished memories, as an important historical record of the British colonial era, as an image that could tell myriad untold stories, and, an, and as a means for examining imagined domestic relationships between Black and white Creole subjects from this particular viewpoint of a Black nanny and a white child in hopes of understanding and healing sometimes turbulent and unspoken feelings that continue continue to haunt contemporary Creole society and the wider Western world. Here, Gardner wraps the object in a, entangled threads of the plant known as love vine, which itself suggests the complex and contradicting notions of growth, but also smothering and suffocating. This image, which itself is inspired by an earlier image, seems to embody much of what this exhibition tries to communicate the capacity of visual images to communicate these complex experiences of otherness and elsewhereness that we struggle to fully articulate, and the capacity of prints in particular to speak to the layering of meaning and multiplicity of experiences, which is the shared human condition in a world which appears increasingly polarized. Uh, and before I end, I just want to thank the artists, uh, the 10 artists from Print London. Uh, I like Patrick, um, was very impressed with our conversations and uh, just enjoyed them immensely. So that's it. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Allison. That was lovely. Uh, so we're going to turn now to introducing the exhibition artists themselves. Uh, it's an important part of this um, discussion to hear from the artists to understand um, you know their response to the to the project as a whole and um, their different experiences from the places in which they have um, that are located although as you'll discover <laughs> they're located in more than the two places um, so we're gonna have first the artists from the Brighton storeroom um, uh, Bethany Pyle and Mark King I will introduce both of them, and then we will, um, uh, each of them in turn will speak. So Bethany Pyle was born in Barbados, and, and you can turn on your camera, Bethany, <laughs> um, and perhaps Mark, but Bethany will go first. Um, Bethany Pyle was born in Barbados and currently lives and works in London, UK. Uh, Bethany graduated from the University of Toronto in 2016 where she completed her undergraduate studies in visual studies. Known for her realist painting, she was associated with setting up the Brighton storeroom in Barbados and currently works with their PR. So I'll turn it over to you, Brittany. Hi there. Um, well, thank you for having me. I just, I had a really good time working on this project. I have really strong links also between Canada and Barbados because I went to University of Toronto and I was in Canada for six years so I felt like my links were really quite strong so it was um, an interesting process for me to go through 
this exhibition that works with both Canada and Barbados and bringing them both together. And I really enjoyed that. I think with my print, I mostly focused on Barbados and what I find beautiful. I mostly focus on water and I really enjoyed like focusing instead of just on painting as I normally do, but translating it into print and working with a reductive carving process with lino cut. And instead of blending and using oil paint, I was using ink and lino cut and just able to like bring up the layers throughout the process. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. And I would also say an interesting point that I believe Patrick brought up was the mobility of print. And I myself am very mobile because, well, I'm back in Barbados right now, but I'm normally in London, UK. And then I was in Canada before for six years. So the mobility of print also kind of was interesting for me because I'm quite mobile myself. So this whole, um, yeah, this whole process was really interesting. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say. I'll pass back to you, Jocelyn. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bethany. Sorry I called you Brittany earlier. <laughs> that was a slip up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Very easy so, mistake. Yeah. Um, good to hear from you. I forgot to mention that you're also an, an artist that works with etching. And it was interesting that oh, yeah. you're printing in, um, I believe you printed the work at uh, Dennis's studio in Barbados. I thought that oh, was. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. That was also really. Um, a really good process as well because I got to work both with Dennis and Estelle was there as well and it was quite a community sort of atmosphere and it was really nice to work with the two of them and I normally work by myself and so working with them was was really fun and yeah it was great. So, yeah. yeah I thought that was really interesting when I heard that you know that had happened. Okay yeah. so I'll turn over to uh, Mark now and uh, Mark you can turn on your camera thank you. Um, Mark King, as we've already heard from um, Patrick, is a Barbadian, New York-based interdisciplinary artist whose work encompasses photography, fashion, surface design, and sculpture. Uh, he was born in Washington, D.C. to Barbadian parents and has lived in Barbados periodically, as well as in the Bahamas, Belgium, and the United States, where I think he's now <laughs> located, but he can fill us in. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks so much for that wonderful intro and thank you so much to everyone on this call and beyond who's worked on these two exhibitions. I really appreciate it and also to the supporters that made this exhibition possible. Uh, yeah, uh, in two places for me, what really struck me about this exhibition is that, or dual exhibition rather, is that I've never participated in an exhibition like this before. And usually when it comes to this international exchange of sorts, it's usually the other way around where it's in one direction, uh, whether that's in Canada, the UK or United States in my personal experience. And to have art flow both ways and the art be prints that exist in two spaces at the same time um, really speaks to just how I'm thinking about space and dialogue when it comes to mind, body, environment as, as um, an ecosystem. And to speak a bit about, if you see 10, there's 40, I went into that, that piece and that addition of four um, set of prints, I went into that thinking about how so much of what we experience in our day-to-day -day lives and how we navigate and we find around this world and our environments is just so beneath the surface there's so much going on and when you take a structure such as a camera obscura what you're doing is as patrick spoke to you're really highlighting how the outside actually comes into our spaces. Right now, if you were to block out all the windows, all of the spaces where light is coming in to your space and you put a little hole into 
whether, whether it's cardboard or plastic shopping bags in the case of the camera obscura that I constructed and you just sit in darkness for a little while, uh, you will actually start to see a live feed of what's happening outside just reversed. And what's being highlighted is the light that's actually reflecting off of the surfaces on the exterior of your room coming into the room upside down. So for example, light hits the tree, tree reflects that light at a straight angle, straight down. So that's why the trees suddenly are on the floor in a camera obscura and vice versa for um, the ground being on the ceiling in a camera obscura. And to really be in two places at once where I'm outside and I'm shown inverted and actually flipped on the wall inside of the studio, that really also just shows how that there's through this refraction, we're carrying the experiences from the outside, um, the ideology that's affixed to the clothing, to the, or actually imbued in the architecture and the urban planning, city planning, that residue is still coming through to your personal space. And um, the title really came from a brief conversation uh, during a residency uh, at Yaddo in upstate New York, where I sat down with a fellow resident who is a brilliant author, a music journalist, podcaster, and I asked her about a Canadian. I asked her about uh, Drake, oddly enough, we were talking about the music business. And um, I asked, well, how many people could be on this team? And she just told me, if you see 10, there's 40. So that really clicked for me and um, relating it to how there's much more beneath the surface, much more in plain sight, much more uncovered that um, is going on. And I'm really preoccupied with the invisible behaviors, invisible, invisible things that guide our behaviors. Uh, so that could be our relationship to objects and artifacts and spaces and how that can guide how we use those spaces and also guide our decisions. Um, so I felt that a camera obscura in a almost um, in an almost magical way can highlight that and bring it to the forefront and uh, spark that conversation. Sorry. Lovely, thank you so much, Mark. Um, that, you know, the I idea of art flowing both ways, um, especially from the Caribbean is, is just something I hadn't even thought about, but is so important. And I think that, you know, that resonates with me when you said that, uh, because it is, it is true that as artists in the Caribbean, you're often having to, you know, send it one way and it's never reciprocated for whatever reason. So that is really nice. Thank you. Um, next, we will introduce the artists from uh, Print London who will speak. So first we'll have Sandy Collins. Uh, Sandy, you could turn on your uh, camera, please. Okay. <laughs> so Sandy Collins lives in Windsor, Ontario, where she's been located since 1987 when she graduated from the University of Windsor. Uh, Sandy has devoted her career to her printmaking practice, especially to the art of linoleum block printing. She is a recent recipient of an honorable mention at the 8th Biennale a Footprint International Exhibition by Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk, Connecticut, and has just completed an intensive bookbinding course by Barbara Hollander from Cabbage. Over to you, Sandy. Hi. <laughs> um, um... What do I say? I, I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this, um, to uh, be with all the artists, uh, sharing that the space in both places. Uh, it's been pretty remarkable when you think of the hours, the time, the thoughts that went into all your images 
and uh, how it all comes together and we get to share and be in one space and not only one, but in two spaces, <laughs> in one very beautiful space down in Barbados and um, London. And um, I have to say uh, with my, my work itself, I, I like to work very spontaneously. Um, I, I like to take other blocks and put them on top of each other and switch things and change things and maybe turn them upside down and um, use different colors and explore. So I really, it's a haphazard sort of way of working. <laughs> sometimes I'm controlled, sometimes I'm not. <laughs> but it's really, really nice to be able to uh, share this with everyone. And I, I'm just very, truly grateful for all the work that it took to put this all together. And um, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, that's it. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sandy. I know you were very keen on this exhibition from the start. You were the one artist who kept sending work. <laughs> this one now, oh no, these. <laughs> so uh, yes, a very prolific artist and <laughs> very invested in, in the exhibition. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so we will turn now to Gosha Martignac. Uh, so Gosha, you could turn on your camera, please. Um, Gosha Martiniak is a Polish Canadian artist who explores the combination of glass and printmaking in her work. She studied printmaking at Western University and completed further studies in glass at Sheridan College. She currently lives in London where she's associated with the Glass Art Association of Canada and is the fundraising chair on Print London's steering committee. Over to you, Gosha. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, thanks to everyone here who's appeared for this panel discussion. Sorry if the sun is too sharp on me. It wasn't earlier, but I'll, I'll just proceed. Um, I call myself a hybrid artist because of the materials I use and the methods I practice. So that would be printmaking, glass craft, and mixtures of the two. So one of these mixtures, uh, which I used for my work in this exhibition is vitriography, which is, if you don't know, when you use window glass as a surface for the printing. Uh, I won't dive too much into that, though. I will go into my approach for in two places. So when the call was first announced, there were minimal restrictions on what you could submit. Uh, the theme of the work didn't necessarily have to fit with the theme of the show, because that was achieved with just the fact that it was appearing in two places, in Canada and Barbados. But I did decide to use the theme as sort of like a prompt in order to like fuel the series that I had been ruminating on for some time. Um, if you're unfamiliar with my work, and uh, Allison has already described what my theme is throughout all things, it's just um, focusing on uh, the fact that death, that we know it is not the final death. And then there are very iterate, like various iterations of that. So like themes that I would explore would be memento mori, urban ruin, and postmortem beauty. So with this series, it's precisely through typing the phrase postmortem beauty into Google that I stumbled upon postmortem photography, which Allison has already described to you. And uh, the common reaction that I get when explaining this practice is usually one of revulsion and uh, discomfort, which makes sense considering how our lives have changed since Victorian um, times. Um, I would say like modern medicine, globalization, technology, social media, and engagement. There's so much stuff, so much stuff in life that any idea of like a time limit for us or our loved ones is just not something we want to talk about, not think about. And we just fill our lives with our indulgences and distractions. And um, while I was doing my studies for my work, I even felt disquieted at times just looking at them due to this anxiety. And the reason why I focus on this imagery for myself is sort of like a way of grounding myself, kind of coping with it, um, is to remind myself that in the grand scheme of things, I am just a speck in the universe kind of deal. And that's not to devalue myself as an individual, but actually it sort of uh, relieves some of the pressure, you know, not too much pressure on us and our time on this earth. Um, I firmly believe that 
our death is not final, regardless if you believe in heaven, reincarnation, or just blackness returning to the dirt. Um, our bodies return to dust and nurture something else, and we as individuals go elsewhere, whatever, wherever that is. So that lends to the title of the pieces that I have in the show, Elsewhere, and it weaves my themes with the theme of the exhibition. These portraits that I have are the husks of the deceased, and where their future should be, I've replaced them with flora, implying that what marks them as individuals have moved on. Uh, they exist in two places in these images. So that's how they fit in. And I'm really happy with how they came out. Um, you can read more about these works and their medium in our exhibition catalog, which uh, my section is graciously and wonderfully composed by Allison. Um, but back to the exhibition itself, as a member of the London Committee, I have some insight to the grand effort in preparing it, but I will speak just about like experiencing it in the professional setting and as a participating artist. So the opening at Satellite Project Space was fantastic, being able to meet with other artists and visitors face to face after our times in the pandemic. And then just talking about the works, like we, it was pretty much the first time we'd seen it all composed in the space. And we were really interested in the sort of conversations each work had with its neighbor. So it was very, it was very cool just to walk around with each artist and just pick out which ones were our favorite conversations and such. And then it was also very refreshing to connect with other artists about like our struggles and how our practice looks in 2022 and beyond. Like for example, I had the pleasure of conversing with High Commissioner of Canada to Barbados, or sorry, High Commissioner of Barbados to Canada, Mr. Glenn Clark. Um, in addition to discussing my art, we spoke about his concerns of preserving the ownership artists have over their work. So protection against um, image theft, something that I've had a similar conversations with other artists. And then we also talked about the struggle of access to proper utilities in printmaking. This one's a personal one for me because he asked me whether I ever considered increasing my scale. And um, it was very nice to open up about that and to feel heard and understood. I'm proud to say that the reception was an outstanding experience. And following the event, I'm part of the PR team. It has been even more amazing seeing the photos and videos taken at the Barbados location right in the storeroom. So being tagged and being able to just reshare that to our, to our page, it has been a pleasure. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank everyone leading and supporting this endeavor, our sponsors, all of our writers, and just all the uh, heavy lifters. And um, it has been an absolute joy being on this journey with you. A lot of the hard work, love, and tenacity went into this making. Um, I really look forward to more opportunities like this, and I'm very grateful to be a part of this one. So and that's it. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you, Gosha. I appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, speaking as an artist to <laughs> what you said there was, um, you know, reflects how we did feel at the opening, thanks. Um, so we'll now open up the floor to questions from the audience. And I'm gonna turn you over to Cindy Talbot um, for guidelines and how we will accommodate your questions. Thanks, Jocelyn. Hi, everybody. Um, if you're comfortable doing so, I invite you at this time to turn on your cameras so we can all see each other. I think that would uh, facilitate a really nice conversation. As well, uh, to see everybody, if you click up in the upper right hand corner of your Zoom window, you'll see a view. If you click on gallery, you'll be able to see us all at the same time. So that that might be nice as well. Um, as far as uh, asking questions go, we've got some people that are joining on Facebook Live. We've got others that are here on the Zoom meeting. So if you are viewing through the Facebook Live, you can just type your questions into the discussion box. I'll keep an eye on that. I've got a second window open here uh, and I'll prompt whomever the question is directed to to answer that. And if you are on Zoom, there's one of two ways we can do it. You can either raise your hand uh, using the, the icon down at the bottom there. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you just click on, sorry, I lost my message here, um, click on the reactions button at the bottom of the window and then click raise hand. If there's not a toolbar, toolbar showing at the bottom of your window, you can hover over top of the bottom of the window and it should appear. 
So you're looking for reactions and raise hands. If you're shy and you'd prefer not to speak verbally, you can also do a chat. Um, you would just look for the chat box down at the bottom, the chat, chat button. And instead of sending the message to everybody, which is the default, just look for my name, Cindy Talbot, in that list, send it to me privately, and I will verbalize that to whomever you, you'd like to direct the question to. So I think that covers everything. So we'll open up the floor to whoever has questions. And you're welcome to unmute yourself if you like at this time as well. Also, if there's any artists that are here that want to speak about their work, rather than just directing a question to somebody, you're welcome to step forward too. I see a number of us are on this call that weren't um, prearranged to speak, but you're welcome to do that. And if you have questions for our, our co-panelists, um, Patrick and Allison, of course, we didn't have questions after their um, presentations. We might start with that. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'm going to throw out a question there to all of the participating artists. Um, I know for me, when when I was trying to come up with um, my top, what I was going to do, I I kind of struggled with thinking about what everybody else was going to do. Would my work fit in with what the other people were doing? And now after seeing it put together, of course, it's curated in such a way that they all do, as Gosha said, speak to each other. But uh, did any of the other artists have difficulty? thinking about that, like, especially between Canada and Barbados, how different is what we might do from what they do? Or is there a commonality with their group and commonality with our group that might mesh or not mesh? So does anyone have any comments on that? I, I can just say that I had similar thoughts. You know, I really did wonder um how it would work out and i think it worked out beautifully and the writing was fantastic and the organization jocelyn was great so but i did have that anxiety i didn't know now yeah. phyllis we had talked about at one point trying to arrange a zoom meeting for all of the artists to get together and just sort of discuss their their approach or or their um process uh do you think that that would have been helpful to you or do you think that it was just fine without Oh, no, I was expecting it. I actually postponed deciding what I wanted to do, waiting for the meeting. And then so I, I would have loved the meeting, but I doesn't matter. You know, it's a, I mean, it was difficult times. And I have that understanding about how hard it is to get this kind of thing going. So. Yeah. Well, we did have um, the one meeting. We had the one. Yeah. 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 Where, where Allison spoke to the Canadian artists. Yes, that and was I good. Believe, yeah, then. Uh, yeah, it was very helpful. Yeah. 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 Um, I think at that meeting, I, I felt like, you know, there was some understanding then between the Canadian artists anyway, of what each, each artist was, you know, doing. Yeah. Maybe Estelle could speak to. That. I suppose that, you know, the word, um, quite different um, sense of how print connected to the particular practices of the artist, whether it was in Canada or Barbados, essentially because Print London is a collective for whom uh, printmaking is very key in the practice of those artists involved in that collective. Whereas perhaps for the artists from Barbados, um, print had a significance and actually allowed a focus in relation to this exhibition, which everyone embraced and really, I think, gained a great deal from. But, but in terms of the existing practices, perhaps they came from just slightly, you know, um, a different balance between artists for whom print had been significant in Barbados, but was not perhaps the core of their practice. And it seemed that for the artists that were from Print London, 
print was the core of their practice. And so to some extent, the way in which processes and the nature of the works made, uh, perhaps there, there was some differences and that's, but that's the magic of this exhibition, I think, that it has a real breadth. It has a real um, sense of, yes, um, the interpretation has been so different in every aspect, in terms of concept, in terms of execution, in terms of um, how it generates back into a practice, into the, the evolving practice. So, yeah, it's, it seems to me anyway, from all the work that I've seen, that um, it has been valuable to every artist, no matter what their existing practice. And that's really exciting to see. Yeah. There is a way in which some of the um, artists working in both spaces, um, their work was tempered by, you know, what's available too, in terms of um, working in a particular medium. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that. We did go through the um, some of the pandemic lockdown while we were dealing with this. So it was impossible for some people to, for example, you know, travel to a studio where they might um, work um, under other circumstances in Canada anyway. Uh, this, as I noted, we don't have printmaking facilities in London on a, unless um, artists have them within their own private studios. Uh, so I know some of our artists were able to work as they normally would because they did have access and others perhaps weren't. Now, I don't know if any of the artists want to speak to that. Um, I can go. Uh, I would say that personally, after I graduated from uh, my studies, uh, I had been working on getting the, like buying the utilities properly for a home studio but there have been connections either through Print London or um, some of my Sheridan graduates where I'll be able to continue on my practice. Like for example, Print London offers rental of a baby press, which has been very helpful in making sure that I continue my practice. And um, one of my Sheridan, uh, is a Sheridan graduate who graduated ahead of me and she has a studio here in London and there she has a sand blasting cabinet, which I am able to use when it comes to blasting my vitreograph plates. So um, although the pandemic has made it very difficult to like say rent space in a printmaking studio, um, there are still, you still find ways to make do. And um, so like recently I invested in a pin press. So I haven't given that a test drive yet, but like there are ways of adjusting if you're ambitious enough but yeah, but the, other than that, there are, if you talk to people and just, you know, connect with them, there are ways where you can scratch each other's backs and uh, get some work done. Yeah. Elisa, I don't know if you want to speak to your experience. <laughs> You're located in Toronto. Yeah. Well, in Toronto, we're lucky to have open studio, and um, I saw Pamela Dodson specifically asking about facilities in the questions, and she works at, at open studio. So, um, for anyone else interested, it's um, it's an open access printmaking studio with shared facilities, but there is uh, a portfolio process, so you have to prove that you can work in the space independently otherwise there's the options of working with custom printers uh, and throughout the pandemic there was access it, it changed depending on the different um, you know limitations of, of the pandemic there were some lockdowns and such obviously but I was able to work with master printer uh, Pudi Tong who gave a talk to print London in the past at Open Studio. So I do have a printmaking degree, but I think Puditan could do a way better job than, than I, and I could focus on the ideas. And so we worked together at Open Studio on the work. So 
and I was lucky to have that access. That's great. Yeah, I didn't see, I hadn't seen Pamela Dodd's um, uh, comment there, but she is asking, she's curious about um, the printmaking community and facilities in Barbados and in London. We've spoken a bit about London, but, um, and how a few of the represented artists came to printmaking. I don't know if anyone would like to answer that. From Barbados, maybe, or Cindy, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll jump in. So I, I do live in London. I went to Western University here in London. So that's how I came to printmaking in the visual arts department there, which is where Patrick is from as well. Um, so I, I happened into printmaking. I was attracted to it because of the technical processes. I also did a lot of darkroom work too. I love chemicals and anything that's really intensive hands-on. Um, and then once I graduated, I did struggle a little bit because we don't have facilities here in London. So uh, I had a number of years that I just kind of languished and didn't do a whole lot of work. Um, I was busy raising a family and working full time and, and my printmaking really has suffered. Um, that's the one thing that I do really appreciate about this project. It spurred me to make new work and, and come up with um, ways to do things at home. Um, I do have a home studio, but it was taken over by my one kid who is a, a computer science major. So he's got monitors and everything set up in my studio and he essentially squeezed me out. So I work now on my dining room table, <laughs> which is not great. But like um, Gosia mentioned, we do have uh, Print London has a, a mini press that I, I did use for the works that I created here. So they are small in scale, a little bit restricted because of that. But I don't think that that was uh, hugely problematic. And and hopefully, you know, I, I'm just going to experiment with more processes now. I do wish that we did have facilities here in London that we could use. But like Gosia said, we just we make do with what's available. Um, and just find a way. Resilient artists. <laughs> Would Jen like to speak? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> if I'm tired, it's because I hosted an eight-year-old's birthday party, and that's why my studio looks like a birthday party in the background. <laughs> it's not my own work back here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think... Um, so for, for me anyways, I got into printmaking. I was lucky enough to go to um, an arts-based high school here in London, Ontario called Beale Art, um, where that's where I was um, introduced to printmaking. It was the first time in my life that I felt like I fell in love with something for real. Like it was, I liked art, but for some reason printmaking, I don't know if it was my teacher at the time, Ron Milton, who was just so relaxed about it that he made me feel like the most confident 16 year old with like acid, you know, and I'm like, just like, yeah, I can, I can totally dip metal in acid. And this is totally normal, you know, and using like lacquer thinner and just like all these, you know, really intense um, materials. And it just, yeah, I think that it just, it felt so like, like it felt so independent of me. And then I loved how technical it was. I loved how, you know, how nervous I was, but it was really, you know, it was exciting and, and then creating multiples of things were just always um, just a really kind of interesting thing to do within my art practice. So that's kind of where my love story with printmaking happened. And then, um, and luck, luckily, like I have a space now where I have my own press and I can kind of work in my own studio um, where I do invite a lot of people to as well to come in and use the space because in London, we don't have um, those independent studios like Open Studio in Toronto yet, I should say. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I got going for you. Thanks, Jen. Okay. Uh, there's so many directions that we could go in with this discussion. Uh, because we're, we're addressing right now sort of facilities, because that was a question posed there. Um, but there was also, um, you know, the discussion around what it means to be able to exchange prints between these two very different places and the artists in these two very different places. And, and if we found any kind of commonalities or differences, Estelle. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the one thing that really excites me about the exhibition is that there is such diversity to how people have formed the images they've made, not just in terms of process, but in terms of thinking, in terms of creative solutions, in terms of individual voice and language. And that, you know, is found in many exhibitions for sure, but there is a real sense for me that 
although very cohesive and coherent, seen together, there are just so many creative solutions happening alongside the fact that personally, there is something about the visceral nature of something that exists that is due to the hand and the touch of the hand. Process is important. And there are, like I say, there are many processes that people have engaged with. Um, but each one of them, even where they incorporate the digital, there is also an aspect that is hand as a hand aspect to the making, whether it's digital and then painted upon or collaged, but also within each of the print processes, there is a thinking that goes on in relation to process, but in relation to the physical object at the end of the process. You know, so nobody gets involved in a process without a sense of the significance of the process in relation to the end object or artifact and so seeing I saw all of the works I'm not you know you can tell from how dark it is here I am actually now in London at the moment but I've seen all of the works uh, when I was in Barbados and you know had the opportunity when uh, Jocelyn brought them over to get to know them in fact you know kind of lived alongside them for quite a long period of time and had this real pleasure um, of having them all around me for a while and um and just as objects just as things as a presence where human touch ingenuity came together to make something physical um that was important and that's what i was saying at the very beginning you know these were two shows that we could have had you know we could have had shows in 40 places a thousand places if it was a virtual exhibition but the fact is that these things physically moved from one place, people could stand in front of them and encounter them and engage with them, you know, as a physical thing and connect to that physical thing. And, and that's quite magical for me. Yeah. Um, Patrick? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, this follows a little bit from, from some of what Estelle's talking about. Um, I was interested when I, I started um, meeting with the artists from Barbados that, you know, in many cases, people weren't sort of doing printmaking as a, as a mainstay of their practice. And some of that had to do with availability of, of facilities, and some of it just had to do with the ways that they, they were used to working. And so I found that in some cases, it seemed like the print was kind of a new way of solving a problem as an artist for some for some people or a different way something a bit other to what they were used to doing <clears throat> and in other cases it seemed a bit more like sort of coming home to something they'd done before but hadn't had a chance to do for a while and when I look at the work of the Canadian artists I would say that in some cases you know I can see that people have um, a little bit more technology maybe available to them on a more regular basis. But it also strikes me that there's really, really interesting, there's a kind of similarity really in that there's really interesting sort of inventive ways that people are working, partly because they don't have a big studio to, to and, and big presses and all of that. So, I mean, Gosha's work, maybe to an extreme, is, is really quite inventive insofar as we think about more traditional forms of etching, lithography, etc. But I would say that that happens across a lot of the work, that there's, there's some form of, of sort of personal invention that comes with actually the limitations of technology and not having, you know, a, a, a grand studio to work in. I'm not necessarily celebrating the fact that you know, sometimes the, the technology is limited, but I think it does speak to what artists do, and that is they find a way to actually do their work. So even in this case where it was supposed to be a print, um, there's lots of ways in, in which people really sort of found a way to do something that was really inventive and at the same time did speak to printmaking. And, and when I say speak to printmaking, it wasn't just doing printmaking, but it was really trying to take up some aspect of, of their work in a way that was being advantaged by the language of printmaking. So, you know, for me, that, that runs across all of the work in one way or another, that sense of of really experimentation and adaptation. Yeah. 
And thanks, um, Patrick. I think that one of the other limitations which we haven't mentioned beyond the, the technical was, was scale. We yeah. simply couldn't um, ship <laughs> between the two spaces, you know, any large scale work. So it was uh, limited on that front um, to work that could fit into hand luggage <laughs> in order to avoid, you know, um, like the expenses. Um, Phyllis, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have a funny experience, and I wonder if other people have the same one. But when I said to people I was in a show in London, Ontario, and also in Barbados, and then they would say, oh, when? And it took a long time to explain to people that the shows were going on simultaneously, and even to artists who had kind of forgotten about auditioning. You know, and I don't know if other people had that, but it was kind of funny. And I think the people I talk to learn more about printmaking. <laughs> Which is odd. That's an interesting. Yeah. 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 I, I have encountered that. <laughs> yeah. um, Dennis. Oh, sorry. Elisa. Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I did want to say thank you to everyone because it, this is just an outstanding. Uh, exchange and exhibition and all the amount of work that went into everything and the catalog is stunning the exhibitions are beautiful i wish we could have all gone to each other's gallery spaces and seen them um and i also just wanted to say just briefly that i love the idea of the whole theme of in two places besides the obvious themes of it being in two places how everybody um explored that in different ways and how it informed the work but also the idea of once the work leaves you, it exists in two places between the viewer and the work itself. So there's just sort of multiple interpretations, which also relates to the idea of the print is multiple. Um, and it's just, it's almost endless, just the interpretations of the theme. So I really enjoyed that. And I love the essays that were written. So thank you so much. And that is all. Okay. Well, we're actually a minute away from our concluding time of 7 p.m. <laughs> I'm not sure that we've um, done as much discussion as we could have, uh, just because there's so much to discuss. Um, but I think we've, you know, we've got it off to a good start. I would like to take the opportunity um, once everyone agrees. I think we should close <laughs> um, to thank everyone, especially our um, co-authors, um, Allison and, and Patrick. Oh, Allison, would you like to say something? I see your hand I, up. I, well, I just wanted to say something quickly because like you, Jocelyn, you know, I was really struck by um, Mark's obvious observation that this exhibition appeared in two places at once. And I just think that everybody needs to be so thoroughly congratulated on what has been accomplished here because it's almost unprecedented. Uh, from a Caribbean perspective, that uh, we're able to participate as equal participants uh, in that kind of really equitable exchange. And so it's really, it's really been quite a historic, uh, and as you mentioned, not easy uh, accomplishment. So congratulations to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, Cindy, did you want to say something? Sorry, I have a message from Dennis in the chat. I'll just read it out. It says, to reinforce Patrick's comments, having lived with the exhibition for some time, a surprising outcome for me has been the overpowering way in which the language of print has been engaged with. Also, a visitor to the gallery said that the catalog was the best they had ever seen for understanding an exhibition. Shout out to Patrick and Allison. That's wonderful. I have to say, I mean, beyond all measure, Dennis, and Estelle have been amazing in making this happen in Barbados. It's not easy to make an exhibition like this happen in Barbados. And um, we all, you know, anyone from <laughs> the Caribbean knows uh, the limitations that exist simply logistically, um, you know, bringing art into the island, bringing things like a catalog into the island, um, just there are limitations around it. So. It was um, an ambitious project um, from that point of view. And uh, Dennis and Estelle are owed a huge amount of thanks for making it happen. Um, 
you know, and the Brighton storeroom is beautiful. And we haven't even talked about the installation of the work in that space. It's a magical space. It's, it's, it's tiny, but powerful. And the, you know, the work, how it was installed there was so creative. Um, you know, the stacking, the coming up to the edges, the, the there's so much we could say even about that, uh, so, which we haven't touched on. Um, so I would really like to say how thankful we are to um, Dennis and Estelle from the Brighton Storeroom. And then, um, yeah, Estelle, you, you want to speak? Well, simply, I had <laughs> some thank you, but I want, to, I want to reiterate again, you know, a huge thanks to everyone at Print London, because I know, you know, there are a team of you who have been involved in all aspects. Uh, whether that's, you know, install or promotion or whatever. But of course, Jocelyn has been the driving force in this. And in terms of the catalogue, she has organised and orchestrated so much. I still haven't seen it in the flesh. I hope very soon next week when I arrive that I will, you know, get my <laughs> little hands on a copy. And uh, looking forward to that very much. Um, I've already thanked Patrick and Alison. I've read their text and was bowled over by them both. And I do want to thank um, Bethany, who's helped us with our, our, our promotion on social media, et cetera, et cetera. I've thanked all the artists, but I also wanted to, to thank Dennis, who has, you know, really been the driving force within Barbados and has been left very much as I had to stay in London and couldn't return as, it, and, as I'd expected. Um, and, you know, so again, huge um, hats off and applause to both um, Justin and Dennis. And thank you very much to everyone else. That was it, really. Okay. So I actually will just share our sponsorship slide. So I don't think I'm getting to thank everybody, uh, but we can read our sponsors. We are indebted to them all. Uh, we did have a lot of sponsorship on the ground, which made all of this uh, feasible. Uh, but of course, the human energy that has been poured into it, the creative energy from the artists and the writers has been what has made it happen. And um, yeah, Print London is super thankful to everyone involved. And thank, thank you to the, the artists for coming tonight, for everybody you know, showing up. Please do try to get a copy of the catalog. And um, yeah, thank you for attending. I see one thing in the chat here. Um, Corey Scott, thank you to each and every one of you who made this exhibition happen. They both are beautifully presented in the gallery spaces. The catalog is marvelous. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, I have devoured it from first to last page. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> really enjoyed the way that Patrick Mann covered the Barbadian artists and Alison Thompson did the Canadian artists. Would have liked to hear each artist speak, but I'm grateful for those of you who attended here. And spoke. Thanks, Corey. Corey, we should mention Barbadians know Corey, but Corey is very important to the arts community in Barbados and uh, has an incredible uh, reach with her uh, monthly art publication, which which um, helps to publicize what's happening in the arts there. And Jocelyn uh, Dennis shared one more comment. He asked for us to do this every three months. <laughs> <laughs> that's my response <laughs> okay we'll see you then thank you everyone uh, and good evening <laughs>